Howdy. So today I am reading Psalm chapter 84. And it goes, How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts! My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Yea, the sparrow hath found an house, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young, even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. They will, still, they will be still praising thee, Selah. Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, and whose heart are the ways of them. Who, passing through the valley of Baca, make it a well. The rain also filleth the pools. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them in Zion appeareth before God. O Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Selah. Behold, O God, our shield, and look upon the face of thine anointed. For a day in thy court, courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in me. Oh. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, I know it's a shorter chapter. Um, it's interesting to me, uh, just a side note, this um, 84 seems, Psalm 84 seems to have kind of shifted gears um, a little bit. I mean, he, King David has been slowly uh, shifting gears more toward from the suffering that he was enduring uh, to deliverance and judgment. Um, but here, it's interesting because in 82, he's talking a little bit about uh, judgment, the uh, corrupt judges upon the earth, and that God is the true judge who uh, shall judge all the earth and render every man according to his works. Um, but 84... Yeah, about justice and vengeance. But 84 is him talking about dwelling in the tabernacle of God, which prophetically uh, seems like it would be referring to that eternal uh, tabernacle, which um, the children of Israel at uh, the end, nearing the end of time, uh, will come and worship God at after he has um, put an end to their tribulation and uh, placed his, um, and brought his, his, the fulfillment of his kingdom on this earth, um, which is Christ, who is ruling that kingdom, um, that they come up and they worship at this tabernacle, which is, uh, I think, hinted at where he says, for a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. Um, of course, you know, Going back to a day with the Lord being as a thousand years, uh, like it says in Second Peter three, um, in Second Peter three eight. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing: that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. But that thousand years uh, also has to do with this. Um, this dissolving of uh, the heavens and elements melting and looking for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Um, and it kind of gets into this future where the children of Israel, the nation of Israel, finally uh, f finds peace. Um, and the fulfillment of the promise that the promise is that God gave them from the very beginning of the Bible, um, but specifically to Abraham. Uh, and anyway, 
without going too far into that, because uh, that's kind of an in-depth study, I'm going to look specifically at, um, well, kind of the last verse, but it has to do with the entire chapter. It says, <clears throat> O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusted in me. Now, out of context, that seems like a pretty general statement. It's like, you know, trust in God, yay. I mean, what does that mean? But he's given the context here. He's talking about people who love the tabernacle of God, whose soul longeth and fainteth for the courts of the Lord. And th there's, uh, it says, even the sparrow and swallow, which if we remember, um, Christ on this earth compares his apostles to sparrows. Okay, so... It's not a sparrow specifically, actually, in Luke chapter 12, verse, um, Luke 12, 26, no, Luke 12, 24, it compares uh, them to ravens and fowls and says you're much better than the fowls, but God, you know, feeds them, so how much more will he feed? you and then um the other one is matthew 6 26 it says behold the fowls of the air for they sow not neither do they reap nor gather into barns yet your heavenly father feedeth them are ye not much better than they so you know the point is that god's watching um after even the least of creatures like a sparrow or a raven and he also talks about lilies of the field um, and yeah those, those two things and he points out how the lilies of the field which are in a day cast into an oven um, are clothed more gloriously than Solomon was in all his glory. And so the fact that this sparrow has found a house, the sparrow a nest for herself where she may lay her young, even thine altars, um, is sort of it's interesting because of that comparison that Christ has made, uh, where he sort of referenced the fact that God's providing for the needs of the fowls, just like he's providing for the needs of his apostles or his disciples. Um, Blessed are they that dwell in thy house, they will be still praising thee. And so um, it talks about the rain filling the pools. Um, behold, in verse 9, Behold, O God, our shield, and look upon the face of thine anointed. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Again, the fact that it says that the Lord is a sun and a shield is interesting because in Revelation um Chapter Let's see, uh chapter five, twenty two five. It says, and there shall be I'm gonna pull it up on here too. Twenty two five it says, and there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And so we're sort of seeing these um, key, key phrases that indicate what this is prophetically speaking to, because all scripture um, has a prophetical application. It applies um, to something, basically when the scripture was written, it had a historical context that it was written in, but that doesn't do anybody any good if it's just, oh, this happens, it's done and over, you know, and now it's just a book that's nice to read. No, the scripture has a meaning behind it, something 
where something that happened that was recorded in the Bible symbolizes or portrays something that has not yet happened. Um, and so this is pointing to that specific thing that it's talking about that has not yet happened, which is this, um, uh, this new king, this new tabernacle sort of that um, we start to see in Revelation 22, uh, which is interesting because it says that in Revelation, uh, let's see, it says in Revelation 21 that In 21:22, it says, And I saw no temple there, and for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine on it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor to it. And so... It's interesting because he's talking about a new heaven and a new earth. The old heaven and the old earth, the first heaven and the first earth, were passed away and there is no more sea. This is not talking about um, the kingdom that is on this earth after the tribulation. I really don't want to go too far into that because I'm gonna. I know that if some, if you're listening to this and you're not familiar with the book of Revelation, this is going to be confusing. I'm just, I'm going to try and keep it simple. It's just referring to this eternal, uh, this new work that God has done at the end of the Bible. Um, and that this is why um, it's so important that up until now, David's been talking so much about tribulation and suffering. And then he kind of changes gears and talks about reproach. And the enemies of the Lord, and then he talks about vengeance. Um, it very much follows this um, secession of succession, I should say, not secession. That's when like a country secedes from the union. No, succession of events that happen at the end of the world, from tribulation to the return of Christ and his kingdom to the destruction of the wicked at a judgment day and to the creation of a new heaven and a new earth and the destruction of the old heaven and the old earth, the first heaven, the first earth. And this is him talking about this eternity for the Jews. Um, anyway, so I kind of went off on there. Um, but that's really the context. When he says, blessed is the man that trusteth in me, um, it has power when we put it in context with all the things that he suffered that now before he believed blessed is the man that trusteth in me but that promise was not yet fulfilled he was going through suffering he was going through all this anguish and stuff where he was in fear and doubt and t at times he felt like god was his enemy uh, um but now he can say for surety blessed is the man that trusteth in me and i mean he was sure of it before but now that promise has been manifested it's been fulfilled and so we see sort of this um, fulfillment of what has been taking place in David's life up until that point now of course David didn't experience um, biblical eternity uh, well not when he wrote this um, he was referring to the fact that when he came into the temple he was able to find fellowship with God and that his connection his access to god through the temple was something that he longed after and that's really that specifically that image of him going to the temple to pray and to worship god and that his flesh uh his heart and flesh cried out for the living god to go back into the temple to go back and find fellowship with god to seek out god and access to god and to pray and to worship him and that he had need of that and that he longed after it and he saw the temple and the house of god as beautiful and this place to be desired to uh, dwell in um and for us we don't have a physical temple um why is that it says in first uh us us christians us uh 
Christians who um, are not Jews, we are were Gentiles, but now we are no longer Gentiles. If we believe on Christ, we are saved. We're part of the body of Christ. It says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Uh, we don't have a physical temple. And to try to sort of drive this point home, uh, it says in 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So we don't have a mediator between us and God. Not only do we not have a physical mediator, mediator place, a me, place of mediation, such as the temple of God was in the Old Testament, it was the place where God mediated with his people, um, but we don't have a mediator other than Christ. Um, so we don't have priests that we have to go talk to in order to talk to God. Um, our priest is, you know, is not a priest to us, he's a mediator to us, he is the midway uh, between us and God, and that's Christ. And if we are the temple of God, then Christ dwells in us, which we know to be true, um, and he gives us access to God directly without having to go to a certain place or a certain person. It says in Ephesians 2.18, For through him, speaking of Christ in the context, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. So here are the three parts of God, the Christ, the Spirit, and the Father. So it's through Christ that we have access to God, but it's also by the Spirit. And so it's kind of like Christ is the door. He's the channel by which we can get to the Father, um, to our Heavenly Father, the Lord God. Um, but... You know, the Spirit is what carries our message. It's what, it's the power. It's the, uh, the rails, the train that carries our message through the door to God. Um, because Christ has opened the door. He is the door. He's given us access. But the Holy Spirit is what takes um, our thoughts and our words, which are not intrinsically eternal things, and takes them into the realm of eternity uh, so that God, uh, we have access with him. It says in Romans 8, 26 and 27, Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us which, with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And so, when we pray, or when we praise, or when we meditate on the Word of God, and we uh, give thanks, it's not our thoughts, it's not our words, it's not um, our any part of our communication or mind uh, that God hears. It's His Spirit that He hears, because the Spirit is in our hearts crying out the Father, like it says up in um, verse 15. And it's the Spirit that makes intercession for us. So the Spirit is with God. And he's telling us, he's telling himself, he's telling God, which is part of, the Spirit is part of God. It's like, it's God's Spirit talking to him, that the Spirit is interpreting for us. It's making intercession. Because with our physical, temporal, earthly minds and bodies, we don't know how to speak uh, the things that God speaks, but the Spirit does. And God's given us the Spirit, which is sealed inside of us, so that we can pray things that are according to the will of God. And ultimately, that is the requirement. It's got to be according to the will of God. If we're praying something that conflicts with the Holy Spirit, that conflicts with the Bible, I mean, it's contrary to the will of God. And so the Spirit isn't very well going to translate those things because they're not translatable. Um, it has to be according to truth. It says in uh, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, 
the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So if there is any question about us having access to God, it should be solved by the fact that we have access to God through Christ by the Spirit that he's put inside of us. Um, and so the only question a person would have then isn't, you know, do we have access to God? Because we do through the Spirit. It's do we have the Spirit? And the answer to that is also yes. Yes, we have access to God because we have access through the Spirit. Yes, we also have the Spirit, like it says here, that when we believe on Christ, when we believe on the gospel of Christ, that the Spirit seals us with that, he, the, the Lord seals us with that Holy Spirit of promise which isn't just a seal, it's also an earnest. It's something that's sealed inside of us, like a stamp that you, is like, you know, in old old times on contracts, they used to take a piece of wax and a ring or like a stamp, a seal, um, and it had an engraving on one side, uh, such as the family seal. It was a, a symbol that they put in the melted wax on the paper contract. And you may have seen this in movies, but you know, it's like a stamp. It's saying this is sealed, signed, sealed, delivered. You know, you've heard that before. Uh, but that's basically what the spirit is. It's a sign, sealed, and delivered. Um, the delivery part has to do though with this earnest because he's delivered the spirit to us, which is the seal, but he has not yet delivered the inheritance, which is eternal life. That is the promise, because he promises to deliver it, but he gave us the earnest of the Spirit, saying this isn't just a seal, it's also an earnest. This is part of me that I'm leaving with you, so that you know I'm not going to leave this deal open-ended. I will make good on my part. And God has said it, and God cannot lie. Um, so... If the Spirit gives us access to God, and we can't lose the Spirit, then we can't lose our access to God. And there's comfort in that. There's comfort, and we should rejoice in that. And not take advantage of it, not take it for granted, but we should always have comfort knowing that the Spirit always gives us access to God. And that is a very unique thing that not everybody in the Bible had. Um, and so... When he says, let's go back, all the way back. Blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. It's so powerful now that we've put it in context because we see that trusting in him, trusting in the spirit and going before him in our hearts, not necessarily in this physical temporal place like they had to in the past, but when we come before God in our hearts, when we open up the word of God, and maybe we don't have the actual Bible with us, but when we meditate on his word, uh, the word that we have memorized or things, maybe we don't have it all the way memorized, but we can remember what it, roughly what a passage says. Um, you know, when we meditate on that, when we start to go into this place inside of our hearts, this invisible part of our being, where uh, the Holy Spirit lives, that all of a sudden we are in the temple of God. And um, that shouldn't be something that we find boring or tedious to do. We should long after it, like he says here, to cry out for the living God, so that if at any time we find ourselves um, having forgotten to come before God in our hearts, to pray and to worship him, in our hearts to have this fellowship, this access with God in our hearts, um, that we should thirst after that. That it's like all of a sudden you realize you're thirsty and that you need to go drink some water. It's not like this, you know, scary thing or this, you know, super legalistic thing that you only do certain times of the day. It's like this constant inside of us, just as much as we need water or bread that we need to be able to go into the temple inside of our hearts and to have a uh, fellowship with God. Um, so, and I mean, ultimately, this has to do with uh, walking in the Spirit. 
It says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Again, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. It's not about just going into the temple of God inside of our hearts. It's not about just opening this channel to God once or twice a day and then leaving it for the rest of the time and never going back. It says here, David's talking about um, whose strength is in thee, in whose heart are the ways of them. Again, blessed are they that, they that dwell in thy house. And David could did not live in the temple of God. But blessed are they that dwell in thy house. What is he talking about? Well, for us, we can apply this and say, if the temple of God is inside of us, to walk in the Spirit, to dwell in the house of God, is to keep that door open and to have the Spirit constantly be communicating between our hearts and God the Father. And it's not necessarily through always, you know, consciously, you know, saying words in our thoughts or we're praying words back and forth to God. In fact, um, oftentimes, how many times did God remind people that they need to be silent and just listen to the word of God? It can be any number of things. Thanksgiving is a form of uh, prayer to God. It says in Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. So it's not so much about saying something specific out loud or saying something specific in our minds. It's not necessarily about quoting verses all the time inside of our minds. I mean, I've tried to do that while I drive and it's just dangerous. That's not what it's about. It's about keeping the Holy Spirit that everything we think about, everything that we do, just the attitudes we have, that it's done walking in the Spirit. What does that mean? Well, it's a very personal thing, um, but it has to do with making our thoughts, making sure our thoughts are conformed. And if we're giving thanks, that we're that is access to God. Uh, if we're giving thanks to God, if we're praising Him, uh, if we are uh, praying for things that we are concerned about, if we're meditating on His Word. Or if we're just trying to do something, like maybe we're at, the, we're at our jobs and we're trying to do a task, but we're meditating on different things and we're continually, every new thought that we bring up, whether it's, you know, maybe I should do this job more thoroughly because I want to be honest and do all, uh, whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. We're making sure that our thoughts are conforming to these things like it says here um, and ultimately it's got to be walking in the spirit it says Galatians 5 22 and 23 that the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace long suffering gentleness goodness faith meekness temperance against such there is no law if we want to be walking in the spirit um, we need to be making sure that our conversation the things that we're doing our lifestyle and also our thoughts are becoming these fruit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. If there's anything that we meditate on during the day, if it's you know a TV show that we've been watching, or what's going on in politics, or maybe it's actually Bible verses, maybe it's relationships, different things going on with relationships, or difficult things with bills or cars breaking down or maybe it's just you know thinking about stuff you know carnal stuff that you're struggling with because a lot of us i mean it's normal for people to think about that too sometimes um that our attitude our spirit because attitude and spirit you know attitude isn't necessarily in the bible but today people use 
attitude to sort of replace what they used to refer to as the spirit in which you did something. A spirit in which you did something is sort of like your mindset, your attitude, your motivation, um, your just overall persona. Um, but the spirit that we need to have in all things, this attitude that we have, is becoming these. It's that we don't necessarily start with all these things, but we take every day, we take this life that we have in the Holy Spirit, that we've been given this new life, this promise of eternal life, that we have been made new creatures today in our hearts, and also we shall be new creatures in eternity, but today we have that manifest in our hearts first and foremost, that we take that reality and that we walk in the Spirit, that we let the Spirit change everything about us, our behavior, our thoughts, words, our conversation, our actions, our thought, I think I already said thoughts. Anyway, um, but that is supposed to be something that we're doing all the time, that we're walking in the Spirit daily, and not just daily, but constantly. It's a walk. It's not like this you know, thing that you just sit down and do a couple times a day. He says, blessed are they that dwell. Let's go all the way back. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. They will be still praising me. And how interesting is that? They will be still praising me. And so it's this continuous thing that's going on where the praise is going on permanently. And they enjoy that. It's not tedious. It's not boring or grievous. Um, and it doesn't look like maybe what we think it looks like. It's not some sort of legalistic thing that has to be us holy, holding a uh, little, um, oh, what do they call those? Whatever the Catholic people hold, the beads with the crucifix on it. I don't even know. I'm a I'm a bad, you know, expert on other religions. Um, but anyway, the Catholics when they're praying, they you know they count the beads and stuff. And of course, what does God say uh, when Christ He says vain that they think that for their much speaking they shall be heard. It says. Uh, I'm gonna all the way down, I think I did a search on the wrong word, because much maybe is a, a little bit too common of a word. Much speaking. Matthew 6, 7. He says, but when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathens do. Heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. That's what the Catholics do. They sit there and they say the ex it's a rosary. That's what it's called. They say the exact same prayer over and over again, thinking that God finds that acceptable. He doesn't. Our hearts move from one topic to another, one thought to another, very quickly sometimes. Hopefully not too quickly, because that you know is the opposite of being careful uh, for nothing. If our heart's moving all over the place all the time, stressing us out, then odds are we're probably not letting the peace of God rule in our hearts. Um, but it doesn't say the exact same thing over and over and over and over again, counting the beads on that necklace. Um, you know, it changes. He says vain repetitions. Let's see if where else it says that. For some reason, I'm thinking it does say that. I just excluded oh my gosh rep petitions vain rep am i spelling that wrong rep petitions maybe not maybe it doesn't say it anywhere else oh my gosh Um, anyway, so if we come back to 2 Corinthians 10.5, and I think I'll probably end here. Uh, it says, 
casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. There are, in our hearts, we have habits and thoughts uh, that we've built up, you know, from when we were lost, even after we get are saved and have the Spirit living in us, we continue to build up these habits and these ways of thinking about things that are not subject to the knowledge of God. The weapons of our warfare are taking these thoughts and submitting them to the knowledge of God. And what is the knowledge of God? What is the knowledge of God? Well, it's very simple. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished, and all good works. The knowledge of God is intricately connected with scripture, the Bible. Um, and so... When we bring these thoughts, every attitude or thought that goes through our mind, every day we're just constantly bringing it up. How does it, does it match up to par with what the Bible says? Does it match up to par with this verse that talks about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace? Does this thought have love? Is it in love? If it's not, time to bring it into subjection, to change it and cast down the things that are not subject to um, the knowledge of God. Any th high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. If it's saying, uh, I'm not in love, but, you know, love's not that important anyway. It's better to really just enjoy yourself and have a good time and forget about the motivations for why you're doing things. And uh, while you're at it, just forget about God, period. That's a thought that is ex exalting itself against the knowledge of God. And it deserves to be cast down. Um, so when we come into the temple of God, sometimes we find idols. And that's really what this is kind of getting at, is these idols. Um, there are a lot of kings who followed King David. And they went into the temple all the, all the time. Uh, but when they were there, they set up idols. Things that they worshipped other than God things that they spent their time thinking about, and it was fun, and maybe they got a rush out of it, but it wasn't God. And maybe they could have been having just as good a time worshiping God, doing perfectly normal things as well, the things that maybe would have looked the same as idolatry, but if they had done it in the worship of God, worshiping God first in the knowledge of God instead of the knowledge of the idol, they would have been better off. It's like when I go outside and I play, you know, a sport like basketball, I can be worshiping an idol in my mind. It's the idol of my ego, wanting to be the best athlete. Those things are idols. They're imaginations that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. But when in my mind I'm thinking, man, I just want to do this in thankfulness and faith, and I want to profit however I can. I'm doing this in good conscience toward God, and hopefully... I get the opportunity to profit somehow, whether it's in preaching to maybe some lost people or edifying believers, or maybe it's just serving my teammates in love. Um, those are thoughts that are biblical. They're in, they're in submission to the knowledge of God. Um, so this idolatry thing, uh, it may seem archaic, but to us, it's very much practical because idols are things in our heart. They're not necessarily little, you know, ceramic statues we have sitting around our house. I mean, an idol is, by itself is nothing. It's what takes place inside of our heart that is idolatry, because that's covetousness. Um, and I can keep going on and on, but this is uh, what I, the main thing I wanted to focus on for that uh, passage in Psalm 84. Just he the fact that he says, blessed is the man that trusteth in me. And, you know, when push comes to shove, we can trust in God. 
uh, because the Holy Spirit will always be there. Um, so let's not just rely on God and you know acknowledge the fact that he's always there. Let's put our actual trust in him in the sense that when you entrust someone with something, it's like you are completely dependent on them, that your sufficiency is in them. It's like an entrust. It's like I'm taking my life and entrusting it to you by I'm going to rappel down this cliff and you're going to hold the rope. My life is entrusted to you. So best, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. Let's not just rely on God and, you know, say, oh, yeah, he's always there. He's just a reliable dude, my best friend. Let's trust in him. And this trust is an action that continues, kind of like how we were talking about walking in the Spirit. This attitude, this spirit of being in fellowship with God. Anyway, uh, those are some of the things I was thinking about as I read through Psalm 84. Hopefully it profits you, and I will hopefully get back on this next week.